when I was a young woman, I lived in Dublin, and I worked at Trinity College in the library at Trinity College. And I lived sharing a house with a lovely woman called Greta Ruddy. And Miss Greta Ruddy was a retired school ma'am, very prim and very proper. And we shared a house. I had a small living room and kitchen upstairs and a bedroom. We shared a bathroom. And she had upstairs her bedroom. And then downstairs, she had the normal house, so living room, dining room, kitchen. Now, in her living room, she had a telephone. <coughs> I did not have a telephone. Back in the 1970s, hardly anyone had a telephone. Nowadays, everyone has a telephone. But back then, if Greta was around the house, I could go into her living room and use her phone. Right outside my front gate, was a big Dublin telephone kiosk. All my friends had the telephone number of that Dublin kiosk. It was quite big. It, two or three people could fit inside it. And it was painted pale green and dark green. And the word T-E-L-E-F-O-N printed in big bold letters above the door. And it was brightly lit. And you put sixpence in the coin slot, and you got a local call. So. If I needed to make a call when Greta wasn't around, I would slip outside to the phone kiosk. And all my friends had that number. And if I knew they were calling at a certain time, I could be upstairs with my window open, listening to hear that phone ring. And if sometimes I didn't hear the phone ring and a passerby did, they would knock on my door and say, phone call for you. <laughs> so it worked out wonderfully well. So this particular evening, I had taken a bath and got dressed for bed, put on my nightie. But I remembered I was expecting a call at 9 p.m. So I thought, well, I'm not going to go upstairs and change. I won't be long outside. It's a lovely summer's evening. I'll just slip out like this in my nightie and slippers and get the call and be back in 10 minutes. So about 5 of 9, I went out and stood by the phone booth and waited. And usually, my friend is very punctual. But that particular night, he was a good 5, 10 minutes late calling me. So I stood out there. And then he did call. We concluded our conversation in about five minutes. And I went to re-enter the house. My key was going in the lock, but the door was not opening. Then I realized the deadbolt was on the front door. So I was banging on the door, ringing on the doorbell, calling Greta's name. Greta was not hearing a thing. She took out her hearing aids took two sleeping pills and was sound asleep. So I'm stranded out there with no money, no pocketbook, no coat, wondering how I'm going to get in. So I go back to the phone booth and I phone the operator who happened to be a young Irish lad. And I said, could you help me? I'm locked out of my house. And if you could please ring this phone number inside my house, I think Greta will hear the phone, and when you, she comes to the phone, tell her, Anne-Marie is locked outside the front door. Please open the door. And he was laughing. He thought <laughs> this was hilarious. And he said, I, I will do that. He said, I will, I will call the number. And sure enough, that very kind gentleman, every couple of minutes, he was ringing that number. And I was out on the street, and I could hear it loudly going, bring, bring. Why she couldn't hear it, I don't know. But I could hear it clearly outside on the road. So I was banging on the door, ringing on the bell. The phone was bring, bringing every few minutes. Greta was not stirring. After about an hour out there, I was beginning to get a little bit worried about what I was now going to do. When up the street came the local police guardie. Now, I lived on a beautiful, beautiful street. Griffith Avenue in Dublin is one of the most prestigious, beautiful streets. Big, big, wide boulevard, tree-lined the whole way down, and the homes were beautiful. I was very fortunate to live on such a beautiful street. So I see the officer coming towards me, and I thought, I'd better talk to this fellow and explain my predicament. So I stopped him. And I explained, I live here. So he said, do you have any ID on you? No, I didn't have any ID on me. But when Greta would open the door, she would confirm I did indeed live there. 
So he immediately leapt into the rescue of the damsel in distress mode. And he told me his name was Seamus. Now Seamus had a friend who lived four or five doors up on Griffith Avenue who was a roofer. And the roofer would have a ladder. And he would go and get the ladder and bring it back and knock on Greta's upstairs front bedroom window. And I would get in. I thought, sounds like a plan. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> so he said, it's getting cold. Why don't you wait inside the telephone booth while I go get the ladder? I said, Good idea. So I go back into the telephone booth and I'm standing there. And he had gone about two doors up when he turned back and looked at me. I don't know what he was thinking, but he came racing back, yanked open the door of the telephone booth and said, you don't look decent at all at all. He <laughs> says, get out of there, hide in the bushes. <laughs> and I'm thinking, hide in the bushes? Why have I got to hide in the bushes? He said, you don't look decent at all at all. Apparently the light in the telephone was shining through my nightie. <laughs> so I had to go hide in the bushes and off he went to find the roofer friend. They weren't gone very long when a few minutes later, the Seamus, the policeman, and his friend arrived with a big long ladder. And they proceed to have a big argument about which one of them is going up the ladder <laughs> to knock on the door. Seamus thought it was his duty to go up the ladder since he was the police officer in charge of this case. But the roofer said, have you ever been up a ladder, Seamus? Seamus said, never been up a ladder. <laughs> the roofer said, I go up and down ladders all day long. I'm safer to go up the ladder. And you are a bit, well, overweight. Seamus was a bit insulted at that remark, but indeed he was a little bit overweight. And the roofer kept saying, let me go up the ladder. And they kept arguing and arguing and arguing. And finally the roofer said, OK, if she did wake up, she would recognize that you are a police officer and she won't get such a fright, whereas I would be a stranger and she might get a bad fright. So yes, you go up the ladder. And I'm still hiding in the bushes. <laughs> so Seamus goes up the ladder and with his nightstick, he's banging and banging on the window. And Greta is still not moving. And the phone is still going, bring, bring. <laughs> and I'm still ringing the doorbell and hiding in the bushes. After about 20 minutes, Greta finally wakes up. Now, I had been outside approximately two hours by this time. Now, it's a very lovely avenue, and the people who are out walking their dogs and walking home now are assembling <laughs> around the front door because this is some big goings on going on on Griffith Avenue this evening. So we now have quite a crowd of people around the ladder, and Greta wakes up and looks at the window, and she sees someone at the window. And poor Greta, she got the fright of her life. She almost had a heart attack. So she raced downstairs and phoned the police <laughs> that there was someone breaking into her house on a ladder at the top bedroom window. Uh. Fortunately, there was a local Garda car. The police car was only about two blocks away. And they came zooming up to Griffith Avenue with the lights blaring, the siren going, and that attracted more people to come out and stand outside. And they were very surprised to see their colleague, Seamus, <laughs> up the ladder, banging on the window. <laughs> so finally, Greta opened the window and peeked out, and she saw this big assembly of people, and me, and she said, is that yourself, Anna Marie? What are you doing out there in your nighty? <laughs> And I said, well, it's a long story, Greta. <laughs> Could you just unbolt the door and let me in? So she did. 